You might have heard the word superbugs before, which are these microorganisms with special genes that makes them resistant to most common antibiotics that are known. In fact, they're the reason why doctors will save antibiotics as a last resort, since using them when they're not needed would push these bacteria to evolve resistance to it more rapidly, therefore creating more super bacteria that we have no defense against. I mean, that sounds weird, right? How can using antibiotics create antibiotic resistance bacteria if mutations are random? somehow using these tools against them can create this pressure to make them evolve in a certain way. This is actually the concept of evolutionary pressure, where a phenomena will drive natural selection in a particular way where organisms with certain genes will be a better fit to their environment compared to the other ones. So over time, the less fit ones won't be able to reproduce as successfully as the better fit organisms and their population dynamics will shift accordingly. In this video, I will continue building on top of my simulation of bacterial evolution I made in Unity. If you want to learn more about how I created this simulation in the first place, you should check out the first video. I did make some changes to how the simulation works since the last video though, so whether you're a returning viewer or a new one, here's a quick summary. Each simulation starts with an initial population of bacteria and an initial amount of food around the petri dish where they live. New food spawn over time, but new bacteria only spawn if an existing one gathers enough energy to divide. Each time they divide, their offspring will have a chance to mutate randomly and their genes in turn will also change, giving them different attributes. The bacteria are aware of the food around them in a certain area, where the size of this area depends on their genes. They also have a certain number of flagella around their bodies, where each one has a certain angle and power. The bacteria are fully aware of their flagella, meaning that they will select the best combination of them to activate, which will get them closest to their current target. The trade-off is that with having more flagella, the bacteria will be heavier, meaning they will need to spend more energy to move around. And by the way, if they run out of energy, they die. Finally, if there is no good possible moves with their flagella, they will tumble, which means they will rotate their bodies randomly and try again. The final gene to cover is regarding their division. Some bacteria will divide faster than others, but on the flip side, they will also mutate more. You can think of this bacteria like cancer cells, where they'll divide more carelessly by not having certain systems that act as checkpoints to make sure that the division has gone smoothly. And an unsmooth division means they have mutated. With that out of the way, let's start with the first experiment. This will be our control, the baseline so to speak. 10 bacteria are initially spawned with random genomes. As the bacteria are eating and multiplying exponentially, their population shoots up and the amount of food starts to sharply decrease. You can see that under the average genes plot, there is no real advantage to any gene, so they always roam around the average level of 50. The number of flagella is steadily increasing though, which makes sense since more flagella means they have more options to move and they waste less energy tumbling. One thing to notice though is that towards the end, when the food is at its absolute minimum, the gene for food detection radius starts to steadily increase. I believe this is because as there is less food around, the ability of having a larger range to detect food starts to become helpful. Now I want to explore this further. For the second experiment, what if there were less food but each food gave much more energy? My hypothesis is that there will be a much greater selective pressure towards the food detection radius gene. And as you can see in the simulation, this is exactly what happens. The value for each gene is between 1 and 100. So the fact that the food detection radius is almost at 100 means there is a very large selective pressure towards this gene. For the third experiment, let's see if we can make another gene useful, which is the division speed one. Currently, the time it takes the bacteria to mutate is between 1 to 5 seconds, depending on their division speed gene. If you think about it, whether they divide in a second or 5, that doesn't really matter because they are both very short amount of time. So what if I instead make this range from 1 to 60? You can see that now, in this simulation, the division speed gene actually steadily climbs, which is great because we did actually create a selective pressure towards this gene. Now let's push this further. What if now the range is instead from 1 to 200 seconds? You can see that the division speed goes up even further. But then towards the end, as the massive numbers of bacteria are dying because there is no food around, again the food detection radius gene makes a comeback since now the food are further away and the ones that are aware of that are more successful. For experiment 4, let's start working on the last gene that doesn't seem to have any evolutionary pressure on it since it's not really changing. I have tried many different ways to approach this, but I just couldn't find a way to create a selective pressure towards higher flagella power. I tried changing the scale of the flagella power, I tried making the scale in quadratic from linear, I tried making the cost of energy to move a lot more, and many more failed experiments. I might not have succeeded in creating a selective pressure, but these these experiments were still not a failure, because they made me analyze my systems in greater detail and actually figure out what was the issue. 
At the end, I didn't really find a satisfying way to create a gentle selective pressure towards this gene, so I left it as is, but I count this as a lesson learned. Here things will get interesting. In the actual bacterial community, it is not that all bacteria are happily eating the food around and, you know, living happily ever after. There will actually be bacteria that will eat each other. For the purpose of this video, let's call them invasive bacteria. Invasive bacteria are very similar to regular ones. They move around, try to get to food. The only difference is that for them, food can also be other regular bacteria. Now let's start the simulation again, but this time with 8 regular and 2 invasive bacteria. You can see that they quickly drove them to extinction. I wasn't really happy with the result of this invasive species experiment because I didn't really see that kind of wild population dynamics change that I thought they would create. So I want to create a higher selective pressure towards the invasive bacteria to actually eat the other ones. To achieve this, I will change it such that they will get half as much energy from food compared to regular bacteria. This didn't really work and I think it's because most regular bacteria just roam out of the map as you can see here. So there was an issue on my end, so I fixed that, and now you can see that there was a lot more bacteria eaten compared to the previous simulations. For this next experiment, how about we really push these invasive species to their limits? From now on, they will only eat other bacteria, meaning they can't eat regular food. But as a little pick-me-up, now their food detection radius is four times as large. In the first test, they actually drove the regular bacteria to extinction really fast. So I decided to instead start with twice the amount of bacteria and also give the invasive bacteria a little bit extra speed so that they have a chance. Looking at the differences between the populations of regular and invasive bacteria, you can actually see that they are almost mirroring each other, which is exactly what we want to see, meaning that as the invasive bacteria eat regular ones, they grow rapidly, but conversely, the population of regular bacteria decreases sharply. Another interesting outcome I want to talk about, when I initially gave the invasive species a speed boost, it didn't really change anything. I believe this was because there was such an abundant amount of food around them that the extra speed didn't really matter. But now that they had much fewer targets, only the bacteria, but they gave a much greater reward, even the extra 40% speed was a great help to create evolutionary pressure towards their selection. For the next evolution of the simulation, I am thinking about adding different kinds of microorganisms, perhaps viruses, and see how their population dynamics would work then. And the viruses will also have their own set of genes that we'll be able to examine. If you want to see that, you should subscribe and leave a like. Also comment below what was your favorite part about this video. Thanks for watching.